Hey friends, it's Lucas here. I hope you're having a great day. Welcome to episode two of my series, Life in Hard Hats. Today we're talking about a particularly special hard hat. This one right here, the Eldred H990N, a beautiful little rock climbing helmet and the first rock or the first hard hat I ever bought. Now it's interesting because when I first bought this hard hat, I was buying it for uh, no work purpose at all. I had no intention of it ever being a significant part of my life. It was simply a tool that I needed to protect my head on an upcoming mountain ad uh, adventure that we were going on. It was me and a group of scouts that we were going to go on. It was, it was so fascinating. We were planning to go on a, a climb, Mount Assiniboine. Some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. That's okay, but it's been referred to as the Matterhorn of the Canadian Rockies. It is an epic climb, it's a beautiful mountain, and it's a highly sought after adventure. My scout leader at one time got it into his head that he was gonna take a group of five or six other people's children on this epic mountain climbing adventure, and we were gonna bag Mount Assiniboine. It was gonna be great. But we had to do a lot of preparation and a lot of work, and we needed a lot of gear. Part of that gear was this helmet. We all needed helmets because of the number of people that climb Mount Assiniboine. There's a constant flow of rocks flying down the mountain. And actually, if you look closely on this hat, you can see all kinds of scratches and stuff from various rocks that it's deflected from my head over the years. But we had to save up money for all this gear. And we, we sold chocolate bars door to door to try and save up money to get the gear we needed. And we tried all this stuff and we were gaining ground slowly but surely, but it was gonna take a long time to get what we need. So my scout leader had a little bit of a creative idea. You see, he owned the chocolate factory that made a lot of the Boy Scout chocolate bars that were sold at that time. And he needed help in the chocolate shop. And it was, an easier way for us to make money faster to put towards our trip than just simply selling the chocolate bar. You know, we were selling, I think, $3 each and our profit margin was a dollar or something like that. But if we worked in the chocolate shop, we could get like $13 or $14 an hour and that would get us where we wanted to go really fast. So we, I, my job was to stand there and pour chocolate bars. I, I had a few different jobs, but I would stand there at this machine. There's this vat of... Uh, uh, just vat of melted chocolate and we would put these chocolate wafers they were like basically giant chocolate chips and it would melt and there was this this pipe that came off the side it had oh it was actually five pipes that went to this header on this sloped table where I would put a mold that had slots for five chocolate bars and then there was a foot pedal on the ground and I would push that foot pedal and the, the machine would make a noise Psh, the air cylinder would push and it would pump just enough chocolate to the mold then I would take that uh, that mold off the side of the table, I would put it on this vibrating table and shake it until all the air bubbles came up out of it. Then I would load it on the cart and put it into the fridge. And I would spend the first three or four hours of almost every Saturday doing that for a couple of months. Then, of course, after I had done that, the, the uh, cooler room would get full, the, the chocolate bars would start to solidify, and then it was time to wrap them. Um, and at, at wrapping time, my job was to then go in, into the cooler, find the racks that were already solidified, bring them out, roll them to the wrapping machine, and then I would stand there and I would take the, the molds, the same one I filled earlier, flip them upside down and bang them on the table. Not so hard as to break the bars, just hard enough to dislodge them. It was an art. It was an art. And I would do that, and then I would take the bars, and as quickly as I could, I would load them one at a time onto the conveyor belt for the wrapping machine. The wrapping machine would take them into its uh, mysterious little box. It would make some noises, and then out the other end would come a nicely wrapped Tippecanoe Boy Scout, Boy Scout chocolate bar. It was really quite remarkable. I had no experience with automation or working or any of that kind of stuff at that time, so. It was really novel and new, and I would do that all afternoon. And then somebody on the other end would take the bars and count them out in lots of 24 and put them into cases and stack them on a pallet. And we did this for months as we saved up money. And the first thing I bought with the money I saved was this hard hat. And then the other couple other things I bought over the years, like I got a, not over the years, but leading up to it, I got an ice axe, a few other things that I needed for the trip. And I still have all that gear today. I'm really, really actually quite proud of it. But we, we, we attempted the climb on Mount Assiniboine. We attempted it over a span of three years. We attempted it three different times. Um, and the first time we had a car accident on the way and we weren't able to go. 
the second time we got partway into the mountain and it started to snow. Except that the snowflakes weren't wet and, and they weren't cold. And they sort of tasted like wood ash. And then we realized that it wasn't snow at all. It was actually the ash falling from a forest fire that was burning right on the other side of the valley we were heading down. Um, and we decided at that point that it's just not safe. We cannot be going into the forest well, the forest is on fire. It seemed like a ridiculous idea, especially with other people's kids involved. So we turned back. And then the third time we were gonna attempt the mountain, we, we were a little bit hesitant because the thing about Mount Assiniboine is that a well-planned, well-executed climb typically would take approximately five days. It was about a two day trek in. It was a day to go up some of the mountain and come down and then about a two day trek back out. So it was a massive time investment every time we attempted it. We had to book time off, well our leader had to book time off work. We had to find adults who could get time off work to chaperone us. Uh, the kids, if we were in school, it was problematic. And there, there was a lot of issues. So we were, he, he was getting discouraged and he started talking to people and he met this guy at Mountain Equipment Co-op, which is a store here in Calgary where we get most of our mountaineering equipment, or used to anyway. And he got talking to this guy and he was, he was a character, this guy. I can't remember his name, Chris, I think. I can't, I really can't remember. But he was this, this little short dude, he had dreadlocks, he was a mountaineer. I'm pretty sure he smoked maybe a little too much weed. And we got talking to him about Mount, Mount Assiniboine and he looked as he was like, dude, you gotta take the secret route. My scout leader was very excited, the secret route, and the guy says, yeah, dude, it's not on any maps, but if you go from the backside, and you go up a little scree slope and across a little glacier, you can get to the Alpine Club of Canada's hut in one day, man, in one day. This guy was so excited. I was skeptical due to this guy's general appearance and general uh, lackadaisical approach to life. But my leader, our scout leader was excited. He had found a way that we were going to be able to tackle the mountain. And this time we were going to be able to try it over a long weekend. So we headed out. It was September long week. I think, was it September? No, it wasn't September. It was October, August long weekend, I think. Wow, I can't remember. It was a long weekend in the summer anyway. And we headed out on early, early Saturday morning. We headed out. It was maybe 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. We got up to uh, the, the parking area where we had been told was this secret trail that wasn't marked on any maps. If you're ever going mountaineering and the trail is not marked on any maps, ask yourself why. <laughs> but this trail wasn't marked on any maps and we went and we investigated right where this stoner dude had told us that we might find the trailhead and he was right, it was there, there was a trailhead and we walked along it and we walked for maybe 10 kilometers, 11 kilometers, and then we came to a scree slope. Now, what he had described as a little old scree slope that we would just jog our way up was actually a pretty epic scree cliff, maybe? I don't know how I would describe it, but it was a far more epic scramble than this kid had described, but that's okay. We were up for a challenge. We thought we would try it. So we headed up the scree slope, and about two thirds of the way up when it started to snow, and then the wind started to blow. And we knew that if we could just get to the top of the scree slope and we could get up over the ridge, we would go down into another valley and then we could start our glacier crossing, but at least there we would be sheltered from the wind. So we pushed on and every step we took got harder and harder and we got colder and colder and the wind started to blow more and more. And eventually it started to, to get to the point where the snow was actually falling upwards. Not, not straight upwards, of course, but as the wind was blowing down the valley and up the scree slope, it was carrying all the snow with it. And it was blowing it up and under our jackets and it was miserable, cold, wet experience. And we, were, we had no idea how close we were to the hut. We couldn't reference the map to see where we were because the trail wasn't marked on any map. We got up to the top of the scree slope and it was starting to get dark. And uh, we were about to begin our glacier crossing, but by this point, the snowstorm had turned into a full-on whiteout. And we could see roughly maybe three or four meters ahead of us, but if anybody was farther than that, we couldn't see them. We didn't have ropes to tie between us to keep each other safe. We had no experience with glacier crossings or crevasse rescue or anything like that. We had to have a very serious talk because you see not only 
Were we vastly unprepared for a glacier crossing, but we were also completely unprepared for a camping trip. Because we had been, our, our target was the RC Hind Hut, which was a cabin that was owned by the Alpine Club of Canada. And it was located in a space called, I believe it was the Valley of the Ten Peaks, but I don't know that that's accurate. But, but it's a valley around Mount Assiniboine where there's several peaks and there's this hut right in the middle. And it's supposed to be a fully stocked hut where all you have to bring is your sleeping bag, your clothes, and your food. Everything else is there. They've got cooking equipment, they've got uh, uh, beds and shelter all set up, they've got uh, utensils and plates and all that sort of thing. So it was great, we thought, perfect, we'll pack super light so we can get in, and in quick and easy and it's gonna be good. But there we found ourselves in the dark in the wind, in the snow, about to adventure across a glacier, not knowing where exactly we were going or how far this glacier uh, crossing was, or how long we had to hike on the other side. We had no idea what the weather forecast was. This was long before cell phones and satellite uh, radios, satellite phones, that sort of thing. It was just ridiculously expensive. Still are, but this was 15-ish years ago, maybe even more. And we had to make a decision. We had to decide, do we press forward to, uh, through an unknown into some very dangerous territory and go to where we knew we could at least have some shelter and a place to cook some of our food? Or did we turn back and head back, knowing that we didn't have tents with us to shelter for the night? We didn't have stoves with us to cook the food we had brought. We didn't even have plates or knives. Well, we had knives, of course, but didn't have forks or utensils or anything to eat the food we had brought with. We found ourselves in a very dis uh, distinctly scary situation. Ultimately, the decision was made to call the trip off, and we, we turned back and headed down the scree slope, and we walked through the night by the light of one flashlight. This was in the days of early, early days of LED flashlights. This is when uh, it was primarily still tungsten bulbs, um, and still incandescent bulbs. So a flashlight would last all of like 13 and a half seconds on a brand new battery. So of course, we're hiking through the dark. We were in bear country, by the way. And at that time, none of us was old enough to carry bear spray except the adults. And we're, we're hiking along by flashlights. And as soon as one of us would pull a flashlight out, 10 minutes later, it would be dead. And then somebody else would pull their flashlight out. Ten minutes later, it would be dead. And, and the scout leader's son, who was along, he was one of the adult chaperones, he had the first LED flashlight any of us had ever seen. And, well, maybe not ever seen, but ever had the chance to use. And he had this one LED flashlight, and I, I can't remember what he paid for it, but I think it was like, guys, I think it was like $125 for this crappy little uh, head, LED headlamp that you would pay now $5 for. But this was the early days of that technology. But after hours and hours of hiking in the cold and dark, this was the only light we had left. You know, at that point, we had been hiking for roughly 27 hours, I think. Uh, round trip and we were exhausted. I was like 13 years old. One of the other girls on the trip was like 13 or 14 years old. We were beat. We were cold. We had wet feet. We were tired. We were exhausted. We were scared. But it was an epic, epic adventure. And this hard hat was on my head for the entire time. Because you know, have to carry it. I didn't want to put it in my pack so I just wore it on my head. It made sense to me. This hard hat has been with me through climbs up uh, mountains that I didn't think I could make. You know, I was climbing Mount Temple one time. I actually found a photo the other day of myself, my friend Brian, and my friend Kim on the side of Mount Temple, and I was wearing this hat. It was, it was a really, really cool picture. If I was more inclined to edit my videos, I would stick it in right here, but one day when I have somebody to edit videos for me, I'll have them stick it in right here. But I found this picture and I looked back and it was just like, wow, holy smokes. Holy smokes. And it just brought back all these memories of all these epic mountain adventures that I've been on that I was wearing this hard hat for. You know, I was wearing this hard hat one time when I slipped and very nearly fell down the backside of Mount Yamnuska as I was running down a scree slope and I picked up too much speed and I got myself into a predicament where my only option was to basically leap off the side of the mountain and hope that I could get my feet back under me. I ended up sliding along and picking up way too much speed and my center of gravity got too far ahead of me and I'm running trying to get my feet back under me. It was like something out of a cartoon. Like I, I couldn't, my feet couldn't go fast enough to keep up with the speed that my upper body was falling and 
I got to the point where I realized he was, I was either going to go face first into the ground, which was jagged rocks everywhere, or I was going to have to tumble. And so I got down and I sort of tucked my head down and I remember the feeling of this hard hat in my hand and I protected the back of my neck and my face and I just sort of got as low to the ground as I could and I leaned into it and I tried to jump so that my head wouldn't be the first thing to hit the ground. I tried to jump so that maybe I could catapult my legs over myself and avoid breaking my neck or doing serious damage or something like that. I, I was falling down a mountain. I didn't have time to have all these thoughts. I was just panicking. But it was like time slowed down. And then I felt myself tumble and flip and roll once. And I didn't get my feet under me that time. And I felt myself tumble and flip and roll again. And again, I didn't get my feet back under me. And on the third time, I felt myself tumble and I rolled and I landed and my feet were under me and I was standing. I was still sliding, but I was standing. And that was what I needed, was to be standing and on my feet. So I was able to dig my heels in to find some deep, loose rock and slow myself down. And I stopped maybe 25 feet from the edge of a cliff that was maybe about a 500 foot drop where I would have certainly not survived. And this hard hat was on my head and I often think about how much damage I might have done to my face and my head and all this stuff had I not been wearing this hard hat. This hard hat was with me on the side of Mount Lorette when my best friend at the time, Peter, and I were sitting there on another scout trip and we had gotten too far ahead of the rest of the group on this climb. We had uh, bolted down the trail to where there was a fork in the road and we knew we were going, where we were going. But our scout leader did not know that we knew where we were going. And so when we took off down the trail and he got there to this fork in the road and we weren't there waiting, he got worried. He thought we had gone the wrong direction. Meanwhile, we were on the trail already up the mountain, waiting, well, where is everybody? When are they going to catch, catch up with us? And we, we hiked all throughout the day and we would stop periodically waiting and listening and we never heard anything. But our attitude was, it's a mountain. It only has one top. We'll get to the top. We'll wait and then we'll see them up at the top. It's easy, right? So we get up to the top and it was a hard climb, way, way harder than we were ready for. Uh, very exposed, we weren't properly equipped. We, we needed backup, we didn't have it. But anyway, we ended up at the summit of this mountain and we're sitting there for like two hours. At one point, I think we even had a nap. <laughs> And at one time, like, we had just finished eating our lunch and we were sitting there and this helicopter comes flying along down the valley. You know, where Mount Lorette is, you're right on the side of the Kananaskis Valley. So you can see, there's a, there's a beautiful valley and you can see a long way. And we saw this helicopter coming. It was a red and a white helicopter. And in the mountains, a red and white helicopter is very often um, search and rescue or some kind of emergency services. And we sort of laughing or jokingly said to each other, oh, wouldn't it be funny if that guy was searching for us? We weren't exactly joking because we were pretty nervous at that point why we hadn't seen anybody else. But uh, we, we laughed about it and we, we sat there for a little while longer and after a couple hours at the surf top we realized like we were going to have to head back down. Like we were going to lose our daylight and it was going to get very dangerous to get off the mountain so we had to leave. And we thought well we'll take the same trail down, we're going to run into the rest of the group on their way up. Like it's, it's going to be fine. Maybe they've run into some kind of problem but we'll, we'll find them. And we, we hiked down the mountain and the farther down the mountain we got, the more nervous we got because we didn't see them. We didn't run into the rest of the group. We didn't, we didn't even hear them. We got all the way to the bottom of the mountain where we had locked our bikes up at this fork in the road where uh, the, there was two different trails we could go and we had locked our bikes at the base of that mountain and we had, didn't see anybody. We didn't see anybody else's bikes either. Now we had been there with a group of maybe six other kids and three other adults, like we should have seen somebody. So we unlocked our bikes, we jumped on them, we headed back down the trail towards the parking lot. When we pulled into the parking lot, we saw our scout leader, nobody else, no other kids, no other adults, just Scouter Rick standing there at the end of the trail. I'll never forget the scene. I was riding along, it was this long straight trail. I was exhausted and tired and worn out and just glad to be back and really on edge because it was weird that we hadn't seen anybody and I saw the silhouette of Scouter Rick waving his arms above his head like this. I could only see his silhouette right at the end. He was standing at the gate to the parking lot and as I got closer I saw he had this weird look on his face. He was white as a ghost. When I got up to him he said, where were you? 
I looked at him in kind of a cocky voice like I often did. Said, we were at the top of the mountain. Where were you? And he got really quiet and he said, looking for you. And Peter, my best friend, and I looked at each other and we kind of swallowed as two young 13-year-old kids who just realized they were in a serious amount of trouble and had done something seriously wrong it's in that same kind of way. And we, we just looked at each other and we looked at Rick and we're like, what happened? And he, he told us the story of how they had gotten to the fork in the road and they didn't notice our bikes locked up. We, had, we didn't put them right beside the trail. We had tucked them off into the forest a little bit because we didn't want passers-by to see our bicycles there and mess with them. Out of sight, out of mind, right? But this group of scouts hadn't seen our bicycles there and their immediate assumption was that we had blown past the turn and we had gone down into the valley into this network of trail or trail network that extended for hundreds of kilometers and they rode around for a while looking for us and they couldn't find us and they started to panic they didn't know what to do so they called off the trip and they sent the kids back home to be with their parents and then they called search and rescue and Turned out that helicopter that we had seen flying down the valley was actually looking for us. And in one of the most surreal moments of my life, as we stood there kind of quietly in this mass of tension and relief and anger and happiness that we were feeling from our scout leader, two conservation officers pickup trucks and an RCMP car pulled into the parking lot fast. I'm talking like lights on, pulled into the parking lot, skid to a stop kind of fast. The two conservation officers jumped out of their cars. The RCMP officer jumped out of his car a few minutes later. The, the one CO said to our scout leader, is this them? And Rick nodded. I said, okay. And, and these two conservation officers couldn't have been more different, right? There was one guy's name was Nick. He was wearing like a, a puka shell necklace and he was like your quintessential surfer dude. And he was like, dude, it's such an epic adventure. And he was asking us all about the hike and how it was. And, and he was really great. And then the other guy was just not laid back, not excited at all that we had gone up this mountain. He decided to tell us all about how the last two people that had gone up that mountain with the incorrect gear had died and all this stuff. And I was sitting there thinking, well, actually it was the two before us because we didn't die. But I, I didn't say that. I didn't say it. <laughs> I probably didn't even think it. Looking back on it, I wish I had, but it was just this really surreal moment. And then the RCMP officer pulled out his radio and he said, stand down, stand down, stand down. They're found. And it was like this moment of like, the gravity of what had just happened hit us just all at once. It was like, holy crap. We just had a team of 10 people and who knows how many resources involved and all this stuff looking for us just because we had gotten into a rush and gotten a little ahead of ourselves, gotten a little, maybe a little bit cocky. And this hard hat was on my head that entire time. It was epic. There's so many memories tied to this hard hat. But the interesting thing is, like, like I said at the beginning, I never bought this hard hat intending it for work purposes. I never bought it intending it for it to even be a hard hat. It's a climbing helmet and it was, it was just simply my mountaineering helmet. But then when I was 16 years old, uh, I was sitting at home uh, just shortly after summer break had started and I got a phone call from one of my mother's hair clients. She had a hair salon and one of her hair clients was this guy who owned a tree care company and he was looking for some help and he called me up. He, he just needed help for a day or two. And I, just, I had nothing better to do. I had a job but it didn't start till late in the afternoons. I hadn't adjusted my schedule yet from school finishing. And so I went to work for this guy and the first day my job was to just drag all the branches towards the truck and put them in a pile. It was easy, but it was fun. I really, really loved it. And the next day, my job was to drag all the branches towards the truck, put them in a pile, and then feed them through the wood chipper. I was 16 years old. I had never run any kind of equipment in my life. It was a powerful, amazing feeling. And after a couple of weeks, I fell in love with that job. I really, truly fell in love with every aspect of it. The, the sound of the chainsaws and the smell of that two-stroke uh, engine, the two-stroke two, two oil mixed in with our gas and the roar of the wood chipper and being around the big trucks and the click of the climbing gear as, as Tom, the arborist I worked with, was clipping in and out of the tree. And just everything about it appealed to me. And very quickly, I decided that I wanted to do something like that for the rest of my life. 
and I talked to the guy that owned the company and my little one day afternoon or two day, two afternoon project to come help him turned into a, a regular part-time job and I went every day for the rest of that summer and I worked with him. And then when I went back to school, I, for the first week of school, I sat there and I was just devastated. I didn't want to be there in class. There I was in grade 12, bored, stiff, and thinking about all the fun I had at work and now I was sitting in school and I was just miserable. And then I thought, hey, you know what? There's a way that I could actually do this and, and, and go to work but get credit for school. And I got, I got really creative and I started talking to my teachers and I said, you know, I heard one time about this thing called the Registered Apprenticeship Program and I wondered if that's still a thing. And I went and talked to the career counselor about it and she didn't know anything. And I went to talk to a few other teachers. I, I even went to talk to the principal. And nobody knew anything about this registered apprenticeship program. And I was thinking, I remembered so clearly seeing an advertisement years earlier on TV about this program where it was there to, to uh, encourage kids to get into the trades and to do things other than academics. And I was like, this is perfect because I also knew that landscaping was a trade. And the only reason I knew that is because growing up, um, I was raised by a single mother who had relied on the help of many of her friends to raise me and it just happened that several of those friends were professional landscapers and many of them had their journeyman tickets and so I knew it was a trade. I knew it was a, a legit actual trade that I could go to school for and I could do and I was just like, and, and I had found a way and, but I couldn't find any teachers that would help me. I didn't find any teachers who even really knew what I was talking about until one day I was having a, I came home from school actually and my mom was cutting the hair of one of the social studies teachers from my high school. Um, it, it wasn't uncommon. My mom was the hairdresser for many of my teachers growing up. But, and we got into this conversation about the registered apprenticeship and she said, I know who you need to talk to. It was like, interesting. So, so we continued the conversation and it turned out that my school didn't have a registered apprenticeship program. But it wasn't because we couldn't, it was just because we didn't have enough students who were interested. I was one of two people at the whole school who was even interested in it. But she told me that if I talked to this other kid who was interested and we both went to her, then she could connect us with a facilitator teacher from another school who would be okay with facilitating the program for us and who could help us get enrolled. And it was amazing. And that was the beginning of my landscaping career. That was the first time I ever thought this is actually something I want to do for more than just a summer. This is something that I want for the foreseeable future, not just to make a quick dollar before I go back to school. And part of the progression of that landscaping career, of course, working for this tree care company was to go from dragging branches on the ground and feeding a wood chipper to go from being one of the guys putting, or to go to being one of the guys putting those branches on the ground, which of course involved learning how to climb trees and learning how to prune trees. And, and I, I started with little shrubs on the ground until I understood the concept. And then I started with deadwooding spruce trees, which was super easy because they were kind of like ladders. And I learned how to use the rope systems and I learned how to use the climbing gear and I, I learned what I needed to know. And then as I started climbing bigger and bigger and bigger trees, my boss one day said, he said, you know, you're, you're gonna have to get a hard hat to wear when you're going up the trees. You know, you, you should use uh, a good quality hat because branches are going to come down and they're going to hit you in the head and you really got to make sure you're protected. And then he said, some climbers prefer to use rock climbing helmets than regular hard hats because they can, they strap to your chin and they won't fall off and it's easier. And then the light bulb went off in my head and I thought of this, my trusty old Eldred H990N, my rock climbing helmet that was sitting on my shelf gathering dust because I was working lots and I didn't have a ton of time for mountaineering anymore. And I didn't have a lot of people to go with anymore. And I grabbed this hard hat and for the next two or so years of my life, I wore it almost every single day as I got to do what is still to this day one of the coolest jobs I've ever had, climbing trees professionally. It was amazing, really, really, truly amazing. And since that period of time, this hard hat has very little it's had very little impact in my life. You know, I, I one time when I, long after I had um, gone through the tree care process and I was actually getting into landscaping construction, I, I was working at a golf course and one time I was wearing this hard hat when I cut the top off a tree the wrong way. 
I, I, I got lazy. I was just trying to get the job done quickly so I could go home and I had climbed halfway up the tree and I didn't want to go any farther. So I had somebody pass me up on my pole saw, extended to 26 feet long. And I tried to make a cut from halfway up a tree, 26 feet out with the pole saw. And I made the cut and the, the top came off the tree. Instead of falling the way I wanted it to, it came back towards me and it slid down the pole and hit me right in the top of the hard hat. I swear if I hadn't been wearing this hard hat, it probably would have knocked me unconscious, at which point I would have been stuck in the tree because nobody I worked with was qualified for aerial rescue. Nobody I worked with even knew how to get, how to use rope access to get into a tree. It was a bad, bad situation, yet this hard hat got me out of it. It was a stupid mistake, and that's actually honestly the last time I've worn this hard hat for any kind of work-related purpose, but it's just so interesting, and it has so many special memories to me. I mean, there's lots of other stories I could share with you about this hat, but I think those are kind of the, the really important ones, the ones that I, that I truly do care to share. And it's just so cool that I get to hold this piece of plastic in my head, and ultimately that's all it is, is a piece of plastic, but it, it brings back so much joy and so many awesome memories and so many reminders of struggles that I've been through and things that I've overcome and it's just it's such an impactful piece in my life and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to share it with you and I'm so grateful that you're still here listening to me ramble on and on and that you're still watching this video so thank you so much for being here pay attention we've got an episode three coming up fairly soon where we're going to talk about this hat here we might talk a little bit about this one but i think i'm going to focus on just this one it's going to be great it's going to be coming in a week or two i don't know when keep an eye out episode number three it's going to be awesome if you haven't yet subscribe to the channel um tell your friends it really really does help me and I'm just so grateful that you sit here listening to me go on and on and on like this. This is so much fun and I'm so grateful to be able to share my life with you. So thanks for being here. Thanks for watching and I'll speak to you again very soon.